Monday, everybody, and welcome into the Graham Lincoln Mac Lane podcast presented by Ingalls, the official supermarket of the Graham Lincoln Mac Lane podcast. I have to let the people in on a little secret here. Mac and I just recorded the whole intro and outro for this episode, and your girl did not press record. So we're back, Mac. <laughs> you know what, KG? You're thinking <laughs> about the beach. You're ready to be on vacation. Yes. You're close. Uh, but not here yet. We got a little bit more work to do. Uh, and, and man, what a fun episode. It's crazy to think this is our last summer guest episode right? where, where we have Jacob Hester, LSU legend, SEC legend, Sirius XM uh, savant, uh, the great work that he does. And, and it was so fun catching up with him. Uh, I tell a little bit of a, a story about this, but KG, I, I played with him all the time on NCAA. I've murdered <laughs> people with this guy. So it was a cool moment for me uh, to, to kind of have that and have him on our show. Um, but yeah, you're ready for the beach. Come on, let's go. My mind is obviously elsewhere. I'm going to the beach next week with the fam, Jacob's first official beach trip, full That's week right. there. And so I'll be hitting up Ingalls to get all my beach necessities. And we know, Mac, that beach sandwich that you have at lunch, when you go out for the day in the morning, you come back, have your sandwich, go back in the afternoon, it hits different. And Ingalls has everything you need, whatever type of sandwich you want for your beach trip, Ingalls has you covered. Let me just tell you, the, the crispness, I, mm. I'm a big tomato and cucumber guy on my sandwiches. Yes, and Mac. Bite into that, and especially when it's fresh and from Ingles, and that produce section is bussing. Uh, I'm all about it. I'm all about it, KG. And I know you, you understand that kind of, that, that midday break where you mm. get that sandwich just helps you for the rest of your beach time. I'm glad you like tomatoes. There are some <laughs> tomato haters out there. One of them is my husband, and I just... I I love I will, tomatoes. I will say this, and maybe I'm going to lose you here, but I, I will not just eat a tomato. You know, oh, like I people will. here in the South, like they, they serve that yes. like as a side. I, I'm not that type of guy. I need it on like a sandwich, kind of in a dish. I'm not just eating a plant tomato. I'm so, so sorry. I will be getting tomatoes from Ingles because they are fresh and local, but Nick's aunt brings these fresh tomatoes Ooh, this, okay. from some farm that she ha she found. And I'll just put some dressing on them, a little salt and pepper, and eat good. them like a snack. Yeah. So You're good. Not, not me, it's a I'm summer happy. staple. I'm happy. All right, Mac, time to get to our awesome guest here. Jacob Hester is a baller on and off the field. He played his college ball at LSU, as we've said, where he helped LSU win a national title in 2007, was also all SEC that year, rushed for over 1,100 yards and 12 touchdowns, spent six years in the NFL with the Chargers and the Broncos. Come on, and KG, now he's in the sports media world, and you got to check him out, Sirius XM Radio, Channel 84. He hosts this show uh, off campus there, does such a great job, and has been with Sirius for, for a number of years now. Uh, I remember he and EJ, you know, did a show together a couple years ago, and it was always fun to hang out with the two of them. So check him out, SiriusXM, our, our network buddy across the way there. Uh, but so grateful for his time. And, and our last guest, as I mentioned, uh, uh, of the season here for the summer guest list. So before we get to the interview, let's have a message from our friends over at Ingles. It's time to discover the convenience and time savings of contact-free pickup with Ingles Curbside. Just visit shop.ingles-markets.com or download the app. And your Ingles personal shopper gets to work with specialized training on how to select the freshest items for a pre-scheduled pickup. They'll even text you with updates. You pull up to a designated space and your personal shopper delivers your items right to your vehicle. Fresh, fast, and affordable. It's all in the bag. Ingles. Low prices. Love the savings. Uh, listen, I, I want to start with this because Kelly and I are, are newer parents, uh, and, and you just added a fifth, my man. And, and it's so funny because I think the two of us are, we're like swimming as fast as we can, <laughs> trying to figure it out. I couldn't imagine five, but four boys you just had your daughter three weeks old. That has to be amazing, man. Oh, it's been incredible. I'm one of five, my wife's one of five. And so it's kind of always the mm -hmm. plan. But, you know, baby number five, it took a little bit longer to get there. Our gap, like we're 13, 11, 10, and 7. So, you know, we've kind of had them back to back. Now, they've all been in different cities because of the NFL career and the lifestyle. It's kind of the way it goes. But, yeah, we finally got settled, had baby girl, fully expected it to be a boy. So it was a great surprise that it was a baby girl. And so, yeah, I mean, look, Philip Rivers is my mentor. That's that's my guy that <laughs> I played with the Chargers. My man's got nine. And so I've still got some, some ways to go to catch up to my man, Philip Rivers. But I do have a 12-passenger van, and that thing's not going to fill itself up. So who knows, you know? 
Oh my gosh, that is amazing. Um, I can I can assure you that neither Mac nor I will be having five children, but uh, your wife is a superhero. That's amazing. Yes. And I did just name my baby boy Jacob. It, it, it wasn't after you, I got to be honest, but I like Allegedly. the name synergy there. So mine is after the John Wayne movie, Big Jake. <laughs> my, my dad oh. loved his Western movies. There's a movie, <laughs> Big Jake, and so that's where I got my name from. And so... You know, I am Jacob Hester, you know, that's kind of the name that, that I go by to a lot of people, but to the ones closest to me, it is Jake. And so hmm. if you call me Jake, I know we have a relationship and I'll probably answer to Jake a little that's bit right. quicker. So I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there just in case you want to have some versatility. That's right. That's right. Well, that's you know what enough. we'll do, what yeah. we'll do is we'll edit that out so people don't know. So you don't have that confusion of, <laughs> Hey, this guy, they just listened to the podcast. Um, before we jump in into LSU, cause KG is going to go there next. I do want to say this, man. It's a little bit of a fanboy moment. I've never told you this before. Cause I wanted to wait until we had type of interaction like this. I grew up playing in CAA and yeah. we kick tail with LSU and you running all over the boys. So I had a, a dear friend in high school uh, and, and they grew up in Louisiana, moved to North Carolina. They were huge LSU fans. And uh, dude, we, we were big time Jacob Hester fans. I just wanted to let you know, I broke every record imaginable with you on NCAA. So, you know, any of that stuff, you want to give me some praise? I made it happen. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, one, like the video game itself, like we all loved it. We all kind of had our squads that we played with. And it's funny, like it's not the squads that we played for. Right. Like right. everybody mm. had their own like kind of system that they used. That's like right. for me, I always started out like as an offensive coordinator at like a smaller school in Louisiana. <laughs> like work your way Louisiana up. Tech, or I was going to go to Louisiana Lafayette. I was going to go to Tulane. I was going to be the coordinator, then work my way around the country, find my way back maybe to LSU. <laughs> but that was my process. And so I was a big service academy. Don't That's let right. me get hot with the service That's academy right. on NCAA. <laughs> so I look, I, I, I love the game. And I, hey, I appreciate it. Was I a fullback or a tailback, though? Because some of my friends listen, would put listen. me at the fullback position. No. And, and throw it no. to the flats. No, I'm not wasting that, man. You're in a tailback. <laughs> you're the main, you're the feature guy. 40 carries a game. That's what we're it. doing. I love that. I love that. that. That's awesome, Mag. I love that story. Okay, so speaking of LSU, first of all, I see your LSU jersey behind you for our people watching on YouTube. Yeah. Um, LSU is hot right now. Now, LSU has always been good at everything, honestly, but they win the Women's Basketball National Championship. Yeah. That was incredible to see a, a team that really nobody thought was going to win it all. They win the Baseball National Championship. Of course, football is is back in the national conversation under mm -hmm. Brian Kelly. So what, what does that purple and gold mean to you? And if you could give us a few... It's probably hard to pick a few, but just a few of your favorite yeah. memories from your time there. Yeah, so obviously like, the women's championship has been fantastic. And one of the cool things uh, about Baton Rouge is they get behind every sport. Mm -hmm. Like when you see the NIL deals, I mean, I would think women's basketball, gymnastics, oh, yeah. softball, they're right there with baseball, with football, with men's basketball. So that's a really cool thing to see and to kind of see it take over the town because it truly did. And so LSU is one of those places they do want to be really good at every sport. And Scott Woodward, the athletic director, has done a really nice job of hiring these coaches. At, at, like if you're a coach in year two at LSU, like the pressure is on. You had Ken Mulkey year two winning Natty. Jay Johnson year two winning Natty. BK's up next. And then you've got Matt McMahon's trying to get the basketball program back on track as well. So it, it's been a lot of fun to watch. It's been a great ride. Uh, LSU, I think, is a very unique school because you have a state that has so much talent within it in multiple sports, and you're really kind of the biggest ticket in town. And I don't say that to be disrespectful to any of the schools that I've talked about playing with on NCAA, but like when you look at Texas, obviously there's a ton of Power 5 programs. You look at a state like Mississippi, they've got multiple schools, even like in Alabama. Are you in Auburn? Are you in Alabama? If you look at the state of Florida, multiple. South Carolina, are you a Clemson? Are you South Carolina? So it is very unique for Louisiana to have that one Power 5 school with a lot of talent surrounding it. And I thought that always made LSU a little bit unique, and it's been a big advantage for them. And you see them take advantage of it in multiple sports. And so it's been a lot of fun to kind of watch the, the other sports because football's won four national championships. Baseball now just won their seventh. But there was something special about that women's basketball championship. When I was in school – LSU oh. went to the final four every Simone single Augustus. year. Yes, Sylvia Fowles. Like, we used to mm -hmm. love going to the games, but they could never get over that final yeah. hump in the final four. So 
to see them finally do that, that one, honestly, it, it might be the most special of all of them. I love to That's hear incredible. you say that. Yeah. That's it's incredible. And the fact that Scott Woodward was able to go and get Kim Mulkey from Baylor. I mean, that's such a power yeah. move to get a coach <laughs> yeah. from a place where she's already won three national titles. Just yeah. incredible. Um, but when you look back at your career, you won the 2007 national title with LSU. You were all SEC that year. Of course, go on to be drafted in the NFL. We'll talk about that. But give me just a few moments that really stand out from your playing career. Oh, uh, if I had to pick a couple, you know, the championship year is probably always going to come to mind. Hey, uh, I love a good two loss national champion. Just put that out there. Right? Uh, You'll take the only it. One, yeah, the only <laughs> one to do it. So what a year that was in 2007. And, you know, if you were number one in the country, really even one or two, like it wasn't good. Like it was some bad luck was going to come your way. And so we lose two games, both in triple overtime, one to Kentucky on the road one to Arkansas there at home, and, and you kind of think that you're out of it. So that's certainly a memory, just having a two-loss national champion. Uh, 2007 uh, Florida game was was an epic game. I'll always remember that one. It was like the height of Tebow time. They won a championship in 06. We win in 07. They win in 08. So it almost felt like that game, if you won that game, you were going to win a national championship. That's what kind of implications were on that game so that game definitely stands out but I think just the two loss and the nature of how we won that championship uh Shady McCoy if I ever see you in public I'm gonna buy you dinner for what you did against West Virginia to get us to that national championship game because you know you don't think there's any possibility I forget what the underdog what the number was on that but they were a massive underdog they win that game Oklahoma beats Missouri we're on a plane back from Atlanta in the SEC championship game we're going crazy. We thought there was no way that we were going to find our way back. But I'll tell you this, once we found our way back into the championship, we could have played the 72 Dolphins and we were going to win that game after getting another opportunity. Man, how about that? Uh, that that's incredible. And that whole season, I mean, like you said, yeah. it, it was just nuts. I mean, Boston College is in the top five. USF is in the top. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> you look at you look at some of those screenshots and you're just like, what is happening uh, but it was Try a great to explain season. that to somebody like, yeah, and now yeah. 2023, it's like, no, they had Matt Ryan. They were right. really, really good. I promise <laughs> right. they deserve to be there. It's crazy. It's absolutely yeah. insane. Well, I, I want to dive a little bit further into the, the LSU thing and, and you being from the state and just how important that is to you. I mean, did, did you grow up? That was the plan. Like it, it didn't matter who offered you, where offered you, you were going to LSU. I mean, it was always the plan if I had the opportunity. Uh, it was a little bit later for me, though, when they did offer. And my recruitment was a, a little different. Um, I was a two-star. I, I was not highly touted. I was 795th in the country. I was 24th in the state of Louisiana. I was a 17th-ranked fullback. There's not 17 fullbacks in the country anymore. I, I don't think that they would certainly give a ranking to. So I, I was a little bit unique. But I had some offers from from – big schools, but not LSU yet. And LSU was stacked at the running back fullback position. They had a lot of young guys I actually committed to the university of Texas before wow. I, I signed with LSU. Uh, Coach Saban actually came to a practice. He was there to recruit like four or five other guys on our team. I went to Evangel Christian. We were a very successful high school. So he was there. Our quarterback was John David Booty, who ended up mm -hmm. starring at USC. Yeah. So he was there to see a lot of other people. And crazy enough, we were doing an old school Oklahoma drill and I'm playing running back. And I guess I had a good drill, a good day at practice that day because Coach Saban goes to my father-in-law, who actually was my offensive coordinator. Wow. And he's like, wait a minute, I'm here to see all these other guys. Like, who's this guy? And he's like, yeah, because recruiting wasn't, you know, there wasn't Twitter. So like, so you different. Didn't know every, it was so different. Yeah, you didn't know right. every single recruit, even though I no. did have some bigger offers and so like he gives him like exactly who i am and i got an offer from coach saban wow. that day after he left wow. practice and i felt so bad calling matt brown because he is the greatest human being of all yeah. time but he understood i was like coach i grew up wanting to go to lsu i also thought adrian peterson was going to go to texas <laughs> right that's <laughs> true that's very true <laughs> you know I, look i'm a confident guy but uh, that's right. i'm not adrian peterson so yeah a lot of things came together and it was my dream school coach matt brown was so good even though every time i interview him now he still kind of gives me hell about it but he was very look he was, he was outstanding on the phone he understood everything so it really worked out in the best way possible because i was really just honestly waiting on that lsu offer and the second yeah. that i got it i tried to play cool i gave it sure. like three or four days oh. but i was always going to go to lsu <laughs> well, what was that what was that conversation like with with your parents i mean your, your people like 
Because I'm sure that was their dream too. And then it finally yeah. happened. I mean, it had to be just jubilation throughout the house. Oh, yeah, it absolutely was. To everyone it's, except my older brother. My older brother is actually a big University of Texas fan. So it did hurt his heart just a little bit. But he understood as well. My parents were, yeah, they, I mean, they were thrilled. I was going to be close to home. Not that Austin was too far from where I grew up, but it was going to be much closer and also, like, I, I married my high school sweetheart, and so my wife, actually, in the state of Louisiana, if you make the right grades, if you make the right ACT score, they'll actually pay for your school within the state. And wow. so, like, that was a big relief because now sure. we were going to get to go to school together, and so that played a factor into it as well. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was a great – my grandma was so happy, y'all. I can't even – like, she was so thrilled that I was going to go to LSU. She used to pay for, like, back in the day when you had to have pay-per-view – to watch yeah. a game because not yeah. every game was on TV. Like if it wasn't on Jefferson Pilot Sports or ESPN, you had to pay per view it. That's how big of an LSU fan she was, and so she might have been the most excited. I, that's awesome. That's very cool. And I know Colin Mac Brown. That had to have been tough, but oh, I think he a, made the right uh, yeah, decision. Yeah, yeah, I think I think so. Uh, being a Louisiana <laughs> boy and now living here in the state, but man, Mac is such a good person that I mm -hmm. think it hurt more that he was so cool about it. Like, it mm. like I almost wanted right. him to be mad, but, like, it's <laughs> yeah. like, no, like, I completely understand. If there's ever anything I can do to help you out, I mean, when I say, like, the nicest human being, y'all know, I mean, y'all work yeah. around Matt Brown all the time. He's hard to beat. And if I had a son that gets to a level where Matt Brown offers him a scholarship, it would be incredibly hard for me to not tell my son, hey, run to Matt Brown and his program. All right, you heard it here first, yeah. breaking news. All of Jake's kids going to UNC. Here we go. <laughs> ACC bound, Mac. That's perfect for the pod. That's perfect. Okay, I want to ask about Nick Saban, though. I mean, obviously we've seen what he's done. He won at LSU and then goes on to Alabama and, and, and does what he's done. Biggest thing, it's probably hard to narrow it down to one, but biggest thing that you learned playing for Nick Saban? that the smallest thing is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Like when I say that to people, sometimes like, oh, micromanaging, I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. Every part of his process carries the same weight. And I think that's really important. Like yeah. no matter what you're doing, there's a reason why we are doing it. We're not going to waste time. If we're not doing it the way that it's supposed to be done, then we're going to figure out how to do it the right way. We're not going to just keep doing it the wrong way. And I learned that from like day one. Yeah. I mean, there was one day that we were having a bad practice and it didn't feel great. And I'm sitting there as a young freshman. I'm like, this, this isn't like the way that, that it needs to be going, you know? And he starts the whole practice over. And he's like, we're like in period like seven. So, you know, and both of y'all know what that means. And he starts the whole thing over. He's like, we're not going to do because, you know, it was, we were, we, you know, we were, it was a training camp practice and, you know, guys were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. You had like a, a break where you were getting water and oranges and different things. And guys were throwing oranges on the ground and not in the oh, trash can. Oh, no. And he's like. <laughs> everything. Gosh. He, he wanted to make sure that within the process that there's a, you know, a, a rhyme and a reason to kind of do everything to get to that point. And so, like, I learned that from him from day one. That's amazing. Mm. It's amazing. I'm glad you specified it was a training camp practice because that is within the rules. There's no hour limit. You can practice as <laughs> you want. Uh, uh, how has he I'm, – I'm fascinated with this Nick Saban thing now. How has he uh, changed, man, over time? Because I think schematically, obviously, it's, it's yeah. very evident, you know, going from hard nose, eye formation – to spreading it out, let's have the best athletes in the world. But how has he changed as a coach? Because I know you're not obviously there, but you've mm. seen it, and, and I know you've talked to him many times. Yeah, I think the best thing for Coach Saban is he did realize that college football was changing, and he wasn't afraid to change with it. So I think whatever the change is, he does it. So there's maybe not one thing to say, okay, yeah, he's changed in that way. He just adapts to college football. Now, he might not like it. Right. And I think he's been on record. There's a couple of things going on right now in college athletics that he doesn't love, but that doesn't mean he's not going to do those things. And so like whenever he had to change offenses, I know that hurt him. You know that the old school defensive mind wants to play 21, 12 personnel, run the football and play great defense. But he realized you couldn't win championships or not to the level that they knew they could if you kept playing football that way. And look, L LSU did it for way too long. Like we've talked about that, too. But he realized mm -hmm. he had to make a change. Like, he realizes in the NIL space that he had to do something. He realizes that in the transfer portal, you have to do 
a couple of different things. And so like he will adapt to whatever he's got to do. And that's probably, you know, it's probably been the biggest change. Now, a lot of my teammates would say he doesn't scream as much as he <laughs> used to. And maybe that's the case. I'm not there day in and day out, but I can say that coach Saban's going to do whatever he has to do to adapt to whatever the best thing for college football and his team is. Yeah. And he's definitely done that. It almost reminds me a little bit of coach K on the basketball side, you know, yeah. you embrace something it may be begrudgingly, but you want to win. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah. When we talk about the changes, you are a guy with, especially that 07 year at LSU, you could have made some NIL money. All right. Let's be yeah. real. You did not have that opportunity. How? Hey, in, they, in, Kelly, they made their own money. You don't have to, <laughs> Jacob was fine. You're good. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> we will, we'll edit that out. Um, but how, how do you think the student athlete experience specifically yeah. for a big name in college football how has it changed from, you know, 20, 15 years ago, even when Mac and I were playing, I mean, none of this was possible, to now? What do you think is the biggest difference? Gosh, when you start talking about uh, NIL and what we could have made, like, I know some people are against it, but I'm just sitting there thinking, like, not even, like, go out there and buy lavish things. I, I know that we got a scholarship check. I know our school is paid mm -hmm. for, and that's very, very important to be able to get your education, and that was important to me. But, you know, I was married in college. I got married going into my senior year, and I started to think my wife actually had to drop out of school. Uh, my $500 little scholarship check didn't even pay half the rent because it was a couple of years after Hurricane Katrina. And so the housing market here in Baton Rouge, because half of New Orleans had to move up to Baton Rouge. I mean, it was, you know, $1,000 a month didn't get you a place that was barely livable. And I made $500 on my scholarship check. Now, I made the decision to get married. That was my decision. But she had to drop out of school. She had to pick up a full time job. And, you know, I, I couldn't help because I couldn't get a job either, because obviously school and, and athletics, y'all both know, like there's no way in the summertime. Yeah, you can get your little warehouse job, but you can't do that during the season. And so, like, there was times like it, it was a lean. Like I could go to the, to the training, uh, the dining hall and I could eat dinner, but it wasn't unlimited meals either. Like that wasn't a thing. And what was my wife going to do? And so. There were some lean times that I think about, man, it would have been nice just to have like a couple of extra dollars here and there. And, uh, you know, I think I maybe would have done well in the national championship team being the running back there. Like, I don't know, but I know it would have helped. <laughs> Whatever it was, it certainly would have helped. So, yes, I, I understand the amounts of money are, are really high and some people really don't agree with that. But you are what somebody's willing to pay you. Mm -hmm. Just like, I mean, we all work in sports media. Like if, so, like, I, I still can't believe, don't tell my boss at Sirius XM, but I cannot <laughs> believe that I get paid what I do to sit there and talk about college athletics, right. but it's what they're willing to pay me. So yes, of course you're going to accept it. And you've got, you know, a family to raise and a family to feed and all those type of things. And so like, for me, like, I don't get as mad about the NIL stuff. Like mm -hmm. I realize you have an opportunity right now. Like I was fortunate to play six years in the NFL. I think I actually could have done better maybe in the NIL space at right. LSU Seriously. than I Seriously. did my NFL career. And I was a third round pick. I yeah. mean, I, I was fortunate enough to be a draft choice, but I still think I probably could have done better or, or very similar to what I did in the pros. And then I start thinking about, think about all the great college football players that we've had that haven't been able to have a long NFL career. Right. And I always think of like the nineties Nebraska teams when I think right. about this, like Tommy <laughs> Frazier and yep. Eric Crouch and even Scott Frost to some extent before he got in to coaching, because like their game didn't maybe translate to the mm -hmm. NFL at the time or, or just uh, Chris Doring. Like yep. Chris was able to have a NFL career, but he was bouncing from team to team. And I'm like, Man, at Florida, he's from Gainesville. He played at PK Young that's on the right. campus of the uh, of the school. Like, you tell me Chris Doring would not have made more money in Been loaded. that setting yeah. than he did in his NFL career. So, like, for me, I kind of always think about that. Whenever you get mad about it, just think this is right now the height of some of these student athletes' careers. Um, mm -hmm. LSU baseball, Cade Beloso. Cade Beloso just went on a tear in the postseason, just had one of the best Omaha's that you'll ever see, won a couple of games for LSU. We just had a 20-round draft. He didn't get selected, right? So, like, that was the height of Cade Beloso. And you know what he had? About four or five NIL deals. And sitting there having a conversation with him, he got to benefit off wow. what he did on the field. Because yeah. when those run out, there's no professional career. That's He's right. going to go to commercial insurance or commercial real estate, and that's yeah. going to be – or media or coaching, whatever he decides sure. to do, and that's going to be his next gig, but it's not going to be a professional athlete.
Right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, very grateful that it's here, man. And I think it's it's well deserved. It's long overdue. And and sure, there's ups and downs, and there's changes and laws and all these things that need to be you know kind of tuned up. It can't just be a wild right. wild west. But yeah. until that happens, these are the rules in place, and and you gotta you gotta play by them. What what about the, the this next wave? We're kind of getting into this kind of new world in real time of college football with playoff expansion and, and these crazy media deals and uh, realignment, conference realignment, all these changes. Yeah. Uh, in your mind, man, is this good for college football? Is this good for what we love and hold so dear? Yeah. I don't know. It's a lot of change. I mean, we want to change in college athletics for a long time. We didn't get mm-hmm. any. And then like all of a sudden we get all of it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a lot to take in. Uh, you know, change is not necessarily a bad thing, but I guess my question would be, where does it end? Or does it have an ending point? Like, do we have a finish line? Like, when I'm running a race, I want to know where the finish line is, and I don't see a finish line right now. And that's kind of what has me a little nervous. Like, at what point is everyone going to be satisfied for long enough for there not to be mass changes? And conference realignment is one of them. And like, I mean, y'all know this covering the ACC. Like, that's the question that always gets brought up. And the grant of rights, and can this team leave? And if this team leaves, what's going to happen there? And then in the Big Ten, we're going to go look up, you know, if your college is on the academic list for you to be (laughs) able to get into the Big Ten. And we're scrolling the list like, oh, man, they're on the list. They might be a candidate for the Big Ten. And so, like, I'm kind of, like, ready for that part of it to kind of slow down a little bit. You know, the Big 12 is going to have wholesale changes. Uh, the American is basically like they, you know, blend with Conference USA. So now it's like, wait a minute, are they a Conference USA team or are they American team? Or I'm, like, I'm going to have to study that and learn yep. that, certainly. <laughs> and then, like, the Pac-12, like San Diego State, they told the Mountain West, no, we're actually going to leave. And then they felt like they didn't have a home. Mm-hmm. And now the Mountain West is like, you know what, we're going to play hardball. We've got this $6.5 million dollar check. You're not going to get it. It's going to sit in our bank account and gain interest, not yours, okay? You can't come to the meetings. The door's locked. You can't sit here. You're not coming. And it's like, what? my gosh, what are we What are we doing? And, like, San Diego State's a good athletic department, mm-hmm. like a good, steady, like good at a lot of different sports athletic department, and they misplayed their hand. And so, like, it's a story. And now, like, where do they end up? And, like, those are the type of stories that I, I'm kind of hoping – go away a little bit and we just kind of have okay here's what it is for just a little bit like this period of time here's what we're going to get and we kind of know what we're going to get yeah and for me I think I'm I'm worried about the regional aspect of a lot of these rivalries you know it's going to be really hard for me to get into a UCLA Rutgers game at some point but as someone who's from LSU or from uh, Louisiana, went to LSU, and you were committed to Texas. So that's a, that's fascinating here. When I look at it from the ACC perspective, there's a lot of people, especially I used to do uh, sports radio in Clemson. They they do not like the expansion. You know, why are we playing yeah. Syracuse? Why are we playing Pitt? And you could even argue some of the Syracuse Pitt fans are saying, why are we playing? You know, why are we going down to Florida? From an SEC perspective, when you heard OU and Texas were joining the SEC, what was your reaction? Good for the league, bad for the league? What were your thoughts? It was a shock. There's no question about that. I mean, I remember being there at media days and a couple of our media member friends, I haven't seen them run full speed like that in a long time. Crazy. There's a lot of hamstring injuries. I think a lot of, a lot of of people trying to hit top speed that hadn't hit top speed (laughs) in a long time. But yeah, I mean, it was obviously a shocker. Uh, You just don't expect two brands like that Mm -hmm. to pick up and leave at the same time. As far as like a fit, obviously, like where they're at on the map makes sense. And the SEC, for the most part, has kind of kept that as one of the things that they want. I I think Greg Sankey mentioned that like seven or eight different times in his opening uh, monologue there at SEC Media Days last year. And I'm sure he'll mention it again this year. So I do like that fact because I do like knowing – a lot of the people that you play, you played them in high right. school, you were recruited by the same schools, you went to the same camps, and there's that familiar face that you kind of see, even if you don't play with them, you play against them for three or four years. And so some of the outside the footprint stuff, it, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that. Like you mentioned, UCLA mm-hmm. and Rutgers, like who in New Jersey is going to spend <laughs> their hard earned money to go watch a team that they right. don't know, and they don't have a history with, we'll see how that plays out and so the sec did keep it together a little bit but we'll see like even that that's not guaranteed that that's going to be successful i mean 
Yeah, on on the surface, it looks great. You're adding two big time major brands, but you know it took a little bit for Missouri and Texas A and M. Like people in the SEC made the joke for a long time about Missouri. Are you really in the SEC? You're not. You're a Big Twelve school, and like Missouri's had some really good seasons, right? Right, and so like that was something Missouri had to deal with for a long time. All that's not mm-hmm. even gone away. Some uh, Texas A and M still. Like they were trying to force an LSU Texas A and M rivalry game. Yeah. And I was like, right. this feels so forced. There's nothing organic about right. this. And it took a seven overtime game for then you know, for it to really have any juice at all. Right. And so maybe somewhat a little bit now, but it's going to take time. Even with Texas mm. and Oklahoma, it's gonna take time for them themselves and for those that have been in the SEC to kind of feel like, yes, this is actually a thing and everybody kind of belongs together. Yeah, and it's, you know, those two, you know, adding OU and Texas, it feels way more like, hey, there's some old school rivalries here. Like you said, geographically makes a lot of sense. The Big Ten, it just felt like such a reach. It just felt like brands, hey, who can we add? Who can we yeah. make a tidal wave, you know, really with? And and so I'm going to kind of put the ball in your court here again. What does this thing look like in 10 years, in, in seven years, in five years? Do, do we see a super conference, two super conferences that's, a mini NFL, do we see it stay the same for a bit? And, and I guess after you say that, what would you want? What would you want to see if you were the czar of college football? I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what happens with the Pac-12. We're waiting on their media rights deal. Yeah. I don't know where they're going to live. I mean, we've heard Ion after Murder, She Wrote. We've heard <laughs> right. CW after Dawson's Creek and One Tree Hill. I mean, it's been all over the place. Hey, One look, Tree Hill is a classic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I said those shows so quick because I know those shows, right. okay? There's no doubt about that. By the way, it's Pacey's Creek. That's the whole thing. He ended up getting Joey at the end. But, like, where are they going to live? Like, we, we don't know that. So, like, I'm nervous for the Pac-12. And, like, I love the Pac-12. I spent, you know, six years of my life out west living in San Diego. Mm-hmm. I, I, I really respect the conference. And uh, there's some really good football teams. This year, uh, that's the thing that I hate. Speaking of, like, change, at Pac-12 Media Day in Vegas – there's not going to be a question that's not about media rights. It feels right. like, like it's going to be the main topic and you know, what's going to not get talked about the great football. That's going right. to be played exactly. out West this year. Exactly. The great quarterbacks that we're going to have out West this year, a team like Oregon state and a job that they've done to become relevant to win 10 games, to mm-hmm. beat up on an sec team in a bowl game. We're not going to talk about those things because right. media mm-hmm. rights, where are you going to play? Who's going to sure. watch? Because Look, the, the Pac-12 network's hard to find. I mean, yeah. you can't, it, you couldn't find it with a search warrant at times to watch USC and Oregon <laughs> State last year. Right. I mean, I wanted to watch that game, and you couldn't. So, yeah. you know, that's gonna that that's one of those things that I'm nervous about the Pac-12. I don't know where it ends up going because it deserves to be talked about in the great football that's going to be played there. So, you know, if we're going five years down the road, what's the Pac-12 look like? I mean, San Diego State, SMU, who you're going to add, Boise State maybe. Right. Uh, you know, Gonzaga was talked about for a while, but now it feels like maybe they go to the Big 12. So I don't know if it ends up being just mega conference. I don't know if it ends up being 32 teams NFL style. I'll be honest with you. I hope it doesn't. Mm-hmm. I, I love college football yeah. the way that it is. I, I think there's something to having different conferences in different parts of the country. That's why I don't really understand why you go get, you know, teams from outside of your footprint because you lose some of that. Um, if it is a mega conference, I think that will be a sad day. Even if it's two, even if it's yeah. two mega conferences, Same. I still think I don't want an AFC and an NFC. I want my exactly. college football the way that we've had it. Now you can make some tweaks and you can make, do some things here and there. That's okay. I understand that. I'm not saying I'm against change, but I just don't think it's, it's the best because like, do we get a, a TCU last year who, gosh, I mean, going on that championship run, getting to a national championship game, how fun was that covering right. that? And do we get sure. a Cincinnati mm-hmm. from the year before? Do we get opportunities to see those fan bases, you know, have those type of moments? And like, if you, if you, if you had a super conference, if you combined everybody and you had 32 teams, like with TCU be in right. that super conference, like, I, I don't know that, but I sit there and I look at the stats of it in the last 14 years, seven of those years, TCU's finished in the top seven. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, th- they've been at the table. Right. In three of right. those years, they've been top three at the wow. end of the season. Wow. Not at the beginning, not in the middle portion. Like, at the end of the year, they've had that team top three. So, like, 
they deserve a seat at whatever table you're talking about, but I don't sure. think that they would get that. And so, like, right. you're just going to tell that team they don't have a chance. They got to go play secondary football. Right. Like to me, that that's just that's mm-hmm. disrespectful to those that have come before that have mm-hmm. played for those programs. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be just a sad day for all of college athletics. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. Uh, it really is because I, I truly feel like that's just where it's going. I mean, there's just so yeah. much money involved. This is a multi-billion dollar business. And how do you get the better product? You play better games. You take away, you know, some of those meaningless games there. And it's going to be nuts. It, it, it absolutely yeah. is. I'm like you, though. I, I hope that we don't see it quite get to that mini NFL type of thing. Uh, let, let's talk a little ACC right here, and then we'll dive into to some matchups. There's one coming up we both might be interested <laughs> in. Uh, just as a whole, the conference, um, where it is, the players it has. Uh, yeah. a, a, as a, I don't want to call you an SEC guy, but you've got an LSU thing. You're a college football guy. Where, where is the ACC in your mind and, and kind of a, a grand scheme of things as a conference? Well, kind of like the Pac-12 a little bit, like I want the discussion to be about the football teams in the conference and not about the other things they're granted right still. And I know it's going to be a thing, but it's going to have some really good football this year. Now you have two right now on paper national championship contenders, always in Clemson. And Emac, you and I have talked about this before. Clemson getting thrown out of the benefit of the Dow Club as fast as they did last year made absolutely no sense to me. It's like, look, they have got the resume. They have done it. And oh, yeah, they're a really good football team this year. Even their, you know, air quotes, bad years, like they still had a really good squad two years ago. And so, like, for me, that didn't make sense last year how they were behind some teams that have more losses than them. And so I'm starting to hear people start to figure that back out a little bit, though. Clemson's starting to get some of the respect that I felt like they deserved a year ago. They certainly have, again, built the resume to get that benefit of the doubt. And so I think you have Clemson. Can't wait to see how Garrett Riley works out. I mean, mm-hmm. that was something. Now, like, Dabo has been loyal to his guys for the recent memory. I know Brent Venables years ago, he went and got him. But, like, he's been loyal. It hadn't worked out. And being loyal, if that's if you're loyal to a fault and that's your worst trade, I mean, there's certainly worse things to be. But he was very, very loyal. So I think it is big news that he went and got a Garrett Riley. You know, he moved Huge, on from yeah. what he currently yeah. had. And he realized, I got to change it up, and he did. And now you go get one of the hottest names out there, maybe the hottest name yeah. as far as offensive coordinator. So I cannot wait to see. Will Shipley, by the way, y'all know, uh, <laughs> look, we, we call ourselves meatheads over on off campus. <laughs> and Bill still actually let us put a all meathead team together. Come on. He, put it, he put it in the magazine, and Will Shipley, He's all purpose on the yeah. all meathead mm-hmm. team. That's a term of endearment coming from that's me. I mean, right. I got my like meathead radio shirt on here. On me. <laughs> As for doing the interview, I cannot wait to see how Garrett Riley uses him. I mean, he is going yeah. to be so versatile within that offense. And so Clemson's going to be there. Florida State certainly is that other team. Jordan Travis, I mean, the job that he did last year to win the games they did down the stretch when it looked like, oh, here comes the same old Florida State mm-hmm. and that three-game losing streak. But – they found a way, man. They roll up, I believe it was, what, six victories in a row to end the season last yep. year. They're going to be there, man. But that first four weeks, LSU week one, Clemson week four, if mm-hmm. you survive that, you not only are a contender, you might be a front runner with, like, right. Georgia and others if Seriously. you roll off those two victories because that's as hard and difficult as it gets. And so those are your national championship contenders. Now we're looking for what's behind that, right? Mm-hmm. Who's team three, four, five? And there's a lot of candidates, and you've got a Drake May at UNC. you got Pitt, who's been consistent under Narduzzi there. They're certainly a candidate. Um, you know, what can you get from NC State? I think I was a mm. year early on NC State. I thought You and last I both. Year, you and I both. Yeah. yeah. I thought last year, man, I had them as like a college football playoff Dark horse. Yeah. A lot of people did. Yeah. For sure. Devin Leary, what they had coming back, it didn't work out for them. What can they do now this year with Brennan Armstrong at quarterback? I, and I love Duke. I love mm-hmm. Duke. I mean, the job that Elko did in year number one, yeah. getting nine wins easily could have gotten double digit wins. That North yeah. Carolina game, still yeah. not sure how they found the a way to Tech lose that game. one. I mean, Georgia Tech's enough. Both of them, right? I mean, 11 I mean, win Duke team. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. It was, and, and look, you've, you've got the two pieces that I always look at returning coach, yes. Returning quarterback, yes. Riley mm-hmm. Leonard, he is going to be in top three most underutilized or under value whatever you want to call it like in the preseason here like people aren't going to put him maybe on their all whatever teams but he is going to be so undervalued he is such a stud at the quarterback position when you have that guy he gives you an opportunity in every game just like with Drake May at UNC same situation you might not be the better team 
But when you have that guy, he's going to give you the opportunity. That's what makes that Monday night opening game, Clemson at Duke, so <laughs> interesting. I mean, gosh, everybody's talking about the other games. Yeah. And they should. Like, we should talk about Florida State and LSU. It's going to be a top, what, eight matchup between those right. two teams. But Clemson and Duke on the road, not a neutral site game, an actual yeah. home game for Duke. They're going to be as excited as they've probably been in a very long time to welcome the Tigers to their stadium. So I'm looking for that third, fourth team in the ACC. If you ask me right now today, I might have Duke number three. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am so you. close to pulling the trigger on that because I believe in Mike Elko. He's the perfect coach for that job. And I love, as I said, Riley Leonard, a quarterback. Oh, man. You and EJ Manuel, too. <laughs> EJ is very, very high there on is. Riley Leonard and Duke. And the, the proof's in the pudding. I mean, we saw what they did yeah. last year. One thing I, that I do want to say is I need the Virginia schools to be back. Oh, man. I, I need UGA, You're preaching to the choir. I need Virginia Tech. I need you to be back to the standard. Certainly Virginia Tech. Certainly. UVA, a little bit more ebbs and flows. Sure. Virginia Tech, when I was playing college football, you were a standard. Mm -hmm. like you yeah, were Eddie some, Royal, you man. If you, yeah. if you, Eddie Royal, uh, Flowers at corner. You had Cam Chancellor at safety. Xavier DB at linebacker. <laughs> you had uh, Tyrod Taylor at quarterback. Yep. And yep. there was a Glennon. Mike Glennon was there, too. So, like, you had a two-headed monster at quarterback. I mean, we could go player for player for player. Yeah. And when you traveled there, you were in for 60 Crazy. minutes of hell. Now, yeah. still to some extent that, but if your team's not any good, you right. lose that after the first quarter because mm -hmm. even the most passionate fans get tired <laughs> of seeing uh, seeing you lose there. So, it's a, it's a proud program. It's one that every single year felt like they were going to be in the conversation when I was playing. Emac, I'm, I'm sure you feel some of that as well. They – I want to see them get back. College football in the ACC is better when Virginia Tech is a good football team. 100%. 100%. For sure. And those fans still show up. Those fans deserve they do. better. They really, really do. I, I agree with you. They do. Yeah, they do. Okay, here's the million-dollar question then. Because you you said Clemson fell out of the benefit of the doubt club way too yeah. fast, which I completely agree. Yep. Who's the favorite to win the league, though? <sighs> I'm Who should go be the favorite? I'm going to go Clemson. Okay. I'm going to go Clemson. I, I just – I. I Florida State is there. It's going to be a hell of a football game. It's going to come down to the wire. You're probably going to, you know, have one of those moments in the game that it's one moment here, one moment there. I understand, you know, you know what that game's going to be like. But mm -hmm. Clemson right now, having that game at home, um, having an offensive coordinator like we talked about earlier, having a Will Shipley who I mean, really I just I think he's going to explode. Now, he had a monster mm -hmm. year last year, don't mistake me, but he's going to explode with a new offense coordinator. Can Kate Klubnick do it? That is the question mark. So when you look at the two teams, obviously like having Jordan Travis, the established quarterback, you're always going to appreciate right. that. But I just think that with all the moves that they made and the defense, we know what the defense is there for Clemson. Right now, I would pick Clemson to be the ACC champ, but it is truly going to come down to, I mean, that game, now, correct me if I'm wrong, there's no division, so we right. can get that game again, right? Twice. We can get a rematch twice. for that Come game. Come on, baby. <laughs> Ooh. Hey, beating a good team, hell, beating a bad team twice right. is so <laughs> yeah. difficult. We Like, when we were in San Diego, the Raiders were awful. I mean, they were a bad football team. And that second time, it would come down to the fourth quarter every single time. It is so hard to beat a team twice. And so – Whoever wins that first game, just know Look you're probably going to have That's to face right. that team again. But, uh, man, I, I love both teams, but right now I give the slight edge because they've been there so many times before, sure. and I think they're playing with a chip on their shoulder as well. Yeah. I'd give the edge to Clemson. Yeah, and, and for me with FSU, you, you just got to prove it. You just got to prove that you, you can do. do it. Haven't beat you know Clemson since 2014. Uh, yeah. the, the, there's just a lot of hoops that you are there. You can do it. But you've yep. got to you got to show me that you can. Uh, let's get There's you out of here. Man. To that though, there, there is yeah, something to that. No There's question. something to to knowing what it feels like to not only win that game but to win the big game, to yeah. win the conference championship, and to know when times get tough and you got to find that play that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You have seven moments if you're a Clemson player that you've right. had to reach to before to win that game. For Florida State, that's kind of a new territory. Not to right. say they can't, but man. I just I put a big emphasis on teams that have done that before, been there before, know exactly what it looks like to go with. I mean, we're talking about the ACC champion, right? Like I feel like when we talk about Clemson, like people think that it's two years ago when Pitt and Kenny Pickett, <laughs> like that was two years ago now. Like right. Clemson <laughs> rolled it off. Clemson didn't lose a game in conference play yeah. last year, and for whatever reason, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, that's forgotten <laughs> whenever we talk about Clemson. 
Yeah, that's right. I, th- I think they'll be uh, they'll be reminding folks of that. We'll see though. That's why we got to play. Uh, <laughs> let's get you out of here. I do want to end with this uh, because I think it's it's the biggest opening game. It's going to be. You said top eight. I think it might be top five with LSU, FSU. Lay it out for me. Lay it out like it's a boxing match, and then give me a winner because we're going to only play this a hundred times until the game. <laughs> oh, it is a boxing match. It is like old school 1993 heavyweight That's right. boxing match <laughs> pay per view where you put all your monies together to try to find a way to buy the pay per view. And if you bought it, 73 people were coming to your house to be able to watch it because you bought the pay per view fight. And I want that game to live up to it. I think it's going to, when you go position by position, these teams are so evenly matched. Last year was such a weird game as well. So we're going to have that intrigue of that and that ending a block extra point. That's going to play on a loop in the coming weeks as well. And it's going to come down to Jordan Travis versus Jaden Daniels. It just, it is. I hate to make it individual in such a team sport, but that is going to go whoever, you know, whichever quarterback, that's how the game's going to go. Whichever one shows up, whichever one plays its best, because Jordan Travis last year was incredible in that game. Jay Daniels was incredible in the second half yeah, to end of the game. that yeah, game. Right. Yeah, so it wasn't enough, right? And you fell just short there. You you can't, like, every tagline we're going to throw to this game, I hope it lives up to it because you're talking about two incredibly talented teams. You're talking about teams that not only return a bunch of starters, but also they dabbled in the transfer portal and picked up key pieces to be able to help out their team this year as well. You're talking about – you know, so many different, you know, guys coming back from injury on both sides. So, like, it has everything. It has everything that a standalone Sunday night opening week game should have. Uh, it's going to be in Orlando, a neutral site. I, I wish, gosh, I wish last year was at LSU. I wish this year was in Tallahassee. Those gosh, games need to be <laughs> on campus. I'm not sure what the environment's going to be like there in Orlando as far as the split. It's going to be a sold-out crowd, I would assume. So, yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about that game because it deserves to be talked about. It's going to have two marquee quarterbacks. It's going to have, you know, guys on both sides of the football that are going to be Sunday players, undoubtedly. So, yeah, it's going to live up to the hype. At least I hope it does. I think it's going to give me 1992 heavyweight fight. Come on. Well, I didn't hear a winner. So is it just assumed or what are we doing? (laughs) Uh, Oof, winner. I mean, I'm going to go LSU just because I think, I think, I think, I think last year too, like if I'm on that football team and that game ended that way, how in the world can you not want revenge from that? Like, how can you not want to go to Orlando, go to their home state and win that football game? And when these teams are that evenly matched, I'm trying to find something that makes me pick one team or the other. Also, Brian Kelly, you're number two. Last year, it was it was a little bit of a mess there at the beginning. The way they finished that season, that's the Brian Kelly that LSU brought in, certainly. And so I think year two under him, you're going to see a different LSU team. And so I'll give LSU a slight advantage. But, again, uh, that's going to be a heavyweight fight that one of those teams is going to, like, start their season game number two as, like, a national championship right. contender right. because of what they do in that game. And you know, both of y'all know this, that can propel you – Sure. Throughout a season, when you get that kind of momentum yeah. off a of week one victory. Thanks again to Jacob Hester for joining us. Loved his thoughts at the end, Mac, on the Clemson Florida State debate. I cannot wait to see how ACC kickoff goes, how much the media is buying the FSU hype train. It's going to be fascinating. A lot of times, especially when FSU was dominating in the early 2010s, the Mm -hmm. media would still give FSU the benefit of the doubt, even though Clemson was up and coming. So do we see that with the reversal here with Clemson and Florida State? I'm very intrigued. I can't wait. I can't wait to see a KG and and for a week away, right, of seeing that. Next week we will, you know, have a little bit of a preview before, but then we're going to hear from our two great ADs over at Clemson and FSU to kind of get you ready for media day. But yeah, I'm fascinated to see with the awards, the preseason awards, the teams, there's so many that are just like border players that you could go either way with, you know, for your first team there. Yeah. Uh, And and same thing with who you think is going to win the conference. So cannot wait. Uh, It's going to be so much fun. And uh, just like this summer series, again, shout out to every single guest that we had uh, come on this show. Jake Hester for being on this show with us. Really appreciates you and our great partners over at Ingalls for making all this possible. But that's it from us, guys. Another great episode in the books. We're getting close. It's right here. ACC preview starting in two weeks. 
Absolutely cannot wait. You guys have to stay with us. Uh, but we need you to do us a favor. Go over to YouTube, subscribe, leave some comments. It's super fun to hear from you guys. We'll have to some really fun stuff cooking up. Like I Ooh. said, there, of course, the OGs over on Apple Podcasts. Rate, review, subscribe. We would greatly appreciate that. But until next time, we'll see y'all. Thank you.